Welcome to the Strategy with Jason podcast. Tune in for everything you need to know to stay in the know regarding the automotive industry. Here's your host, Jason Harris. Hey, 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 what's going on, Podcast Nation? It is Jason Harris here, and thank you for joining me another episode of Strategy with Jason. Today, I have a great podcast set up for you. I have an amazing guest. I have the one, the only, the oh-so-famous Mr. Colton Ray in the house. Colton, what's up? Hey, how you doing, Jason? <laughs> good, good, man. I'm so excited. You know, I'm actually so excited that we've been talking for like the last hour before I even hit the record button, which there was probably some amazing content in there, but we're going to make this next 45 minutes even more amazing, aren't we? We're going to try. <laughs> hey, Colton, for everybody out there that's watching, listening, and maybe don't know who you are or a little bit about your background and how you got started in the industry, I love kicking off every single one of these podcasts with a little origin story. So, Ooh, Colton, like how did you get started in this crazy little world we call the automotive industry? Uh, yeah, I love uh, I love the origin stories. Um, this started in the car business when I was 15 probably like most that listen to your podcast started washing cars <laughs> uh, was sick and tired of salespeople bringing me cars. I I'm, I live in Minnesota and my car business start was in Minnesota. So if you know what Minnesota's like in the winter, it's pretty brutal in the detail bay, uh, you know, using the pressure washer, shoes getting soaked, uh, watching the salespeople bring me cars. I, I had it one day. I think I walked up to the general manager his name was Randy Lamley. I said, Randy, you got to give me a shot to sell some cars. I can do this. Put me in coach. And, uh, I think that was probably when I was, uh, late 17, early 18 year old. And, uh, the rest is history. That's awesome. You know, I find like a lot of us, we get started in this industry pretty early, but you know, the ones that stick around and continue to kind of evolve, they're hungry. And, yeah. you know, it's like, if you notice that, like you, you'll go into a dealership and you'll see like some, some new young person that just started working and, and you get talking to him for like maybe two minutes and you're like, this guy's got some hunger. You know, she, she wants this, you know, and it's, it, it's cool. Um, I don't think we see it as much though, as, as we used to, you know, it's yeah. like, especially right now, I think, you know, during, during this health crisis that we have right now, um, you know, to kind I do, of I do love the like progression that. watching people. Um, uh, I worked for the Walzer automotive group up until this last, uh, last year, uh, now with Fuse Auto Tech, but I even think about the Walls Automotive Group. I I hired uh, this person. His name was Enrique. Uh, Enrique wanted to sell cars. He wasn't uh, ready for that. I put him as a, a lot uh, attendant detailer, and it's so funny. Years later, Enrique is our top Nissan inventory uh, at uh, top Nissan inventory manager at, at Walls Automotive Group. So it's so fun to watch this progression of people in the business. Um, so I still it's, think it's there, right, Jason? It, it uh, is. It's incredibly there. satisfying to see that, yeah. though. I actually yeah. just got a, a a message, a DM recently for someone that I actually did not hire, uh, which was kind of ironic. I told them that they just didn't have enough experience to be an F&I manager, and I gave them a good reason why. And I said, this is what you should do. And um, I had no idea they actually did listen to what I said. Went to go Amazing. work for this for this one dealership that I knew had a great training program in place. They hired a great trainer. And I said, go work for that dealership for 24 months, and I'd be willing to bet you you're going to be ready more so than any other candidate out there. And sure enough, that's exactly what she did. And she's a finance manager now. And she actually, she actually DM'd me and said, thank you for not, you know, hiring me. <laughs> yeah, well, what we're describing here is uh, institutional knowledge. Right. And the only way to get it in our business is be in the business. Uh, so it's a really cool thing. I do love that about the car business. Uh, it does reward uh, those that are hungry, as you described, and uh, you know, willingness to learn and putting the time in with that hunger, that willingness to learn, uh, good things happen to those. So very it, is, cool. it seems like right now that is the key for anybody out there. If they're working in operations, if they're working in marketing, you know, if they're strategizing for the dealership, you know, as far as usage of technology and digital retailing, anything else out there, it's just how hungry are you? Uh, because, yeah. you know, there, there's an approach to it. You know, it, it's, you're not going to knock it out of the park every single time you step up to the plate. And you got to be able, you got to be able to have that, that tenacity or that, that thick skin to continue to move on. Um, before we actually started recording, we had this great conversation. We were kind of kicking it old school, reminiscing about the good old days, where we were talking about, you know, at what point in time did, you know, internet leads become internet leads? 
you know, because that's not what they were originally called. You know, we, we, we just called them, you know, form In- fills or inquiries, form inquiries, 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 right? And, and the, but that's what it was. It was, it was an inquiry. It was somebody asking a question and then depending on like how the conversation went, they could generate into a lead. I remember that leads were only appointments on the board. That was a lead. That was it, you know? And it seems like that's kind of progressed on to the point where, you know, our idea of what a lead is has kind of affected what we see an online shopper. So we have this yeah. stigma between an online shopper and an in-store shopper. In your words, what do you think the difference is? Well, I don't want to just come out right and say it, but I'm going, Jason. Um, <laughs> I believe the in-store shopper is the exact same as our online shopper. I, I think they're looking for the same thing. They're looking for price transparency. They're looking for um, respect for their time. Uh, they want some control of the process. And I truly believe that an in-store shopper wants those same things as an online shopper. And I, not, not to be on the soapbox here, but, you know, I talk to dealers every single day that, you know, they call and say, I'd, I'd love to fix our, online sales process and as we peel back the onion similar to what you do uh, Jason in your your field with consulting dealers what I find is there's uh, roadblocks in their current in-store process uh, that would uh, hinder any progression that they'd like to make online in fact my my best advice for dealers is treat an in-store shopper just as if they were online and if you can do that you can reduce the touches to the desk. We can get payments to the customers quickly. We can con- connect our legacy systems in store. Um, then I think the vision and aspirations to sell a car, truly sell a car online, or to create a great online sales process will just, <laughs> like dominoes, just fall over. It'll be so easy. Well, I, I find in our industry, the transition has always been really tough, right? Like our transition from sales to F&I is really tough. Our yeah. transition from selling a car over to service department is tough. How's that handover happen, right? Good dealerships do it really well. It seems like, though, as an industry, we've really struggled to figure out what the handover or kind of the transition is yeah. from online and to in-store. And I think a lot of it has to do with this this the salesperson or sales manager stigma of who that type of customer is. I mean, look, before, before they were internet inquiries and you may remember this, I remember the fax machine. Oh yeah. Yeah. We (laughs) received leads through fax, right? Like somebody would, would fax you and and, and they would fax 17, four dealerships and they would say, here's the car I'm looking for, you know, fax me back your best price. So that, that type of customer has always existed. I don't think it's ever not. Um, but at some point, we, we've held on to this, you know, oh, it's an internet customer stigma. And I think oh. we, we can't move on to create a good, you know, transition from online to in-store unless we get rid of that stigma. How do yeah. you think we can get rid of that stigma inside the dealership? Well, I think, Jason, I mean, it, it's it's a difficult one. And it's, and it's really for progressive, for progressive dealers. I mean, it's that's my honest take on it. I think you've, you've got to want to create efficiencies on, in your in-store process, whether again, going back to, you know, price transparency, how can we get the customer, the numbers quickly when they ask? Um, there might still be a touch to the desk, but, but maybe it's, it's more efficient through technology. Um, in my perfect world, the salesperson is, is, is using a, a platform that they can just provide that information quickly uh, based on what the dealership pricing is and the parameters that have been set up behind the scenes for the dealer. Um, I also believe uh, that we, that we need to streamline the way we can check out our customers. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think that's a big pain point. We all experience that the customer has said, yes, they want to buy the car. They've agreed to the numbers they filled out the privacy notice. You got the copies of the driver's license and insurance. You've done the credit application. You've, you've written up, you handwritten up the, the purchase agreement, even though that's going to get reprinted in the, the business office. I think this whole doing all the paperwork once and then waiting for someone to process the paperwork another hour to two hours, I think it's just, it's just killing the customer experience. I, I really believe we need to empower uh, more people than just the finance manager 
to complete a vehicle transaction on the showroom floor. I think that's a really um, good point. I mean, when you think about it, you know, that online shopper has a set of tech stack at their disposal online that allows them to do what they want to do. They, they control necessary. in the process. They, they, have, they control have control. The they have process. control. And, you know, we are never, you know, I remember actually, this is a funny story. Sometimes I go, I go off in a tangent, but I, I remember um, one of my first weeks of training all right, at, at, at the car dealership as a salesperson, all right? I remember there was two days of training about how to maintain control of the customer. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not shitting you. I'm totally serious on this. In fact, I, know, I actually I know. remember someone teaching me that when I opened up the hood of the car, don't use the little you know rod to keep it up. Make your customer hold it for you. Oh. And it was it was all these little techniques and like I mean the trainer was he had the full plaid jacket it was a total stereotype right uh, but that's what it was it was all about control and, and and I feel like we we really haven't let go of that control with inside the dealership but online we have let go of that control we through technology and some great products yeah. like your like your company has uh, that has allowed the the customer to take control online but the disconnect seems to be in the store. How do we get a dealership to, you know, let go of that control and continue to have the customer, you know, be in the driver's seat? Well, I think first off, you, the, the dealer has to be uh, open uh, to a few different things. Uh, first thing in my mind is maybe open is the wrong word. They have to have the goal or the vision or the aspiration mm, yes. to speed up the transaction. So I think that's the first thing, right? Because why create operational efficiency and store if you don't care how long it takes? So I think the National Automobile Dealer Association says the transaction time, time takes approximately three hours in the United States. I don't know how long it takes in Canada. You could probably help me with that, Jason. Uh, <laughs> two days. But, yeah, two days. Oh, wow, even worse. Okay. So Because uh, we don't let people have uh, temp plates. So you actually have to go through a registration process. There you go. So I think at least during the process that the customer is in store, we have to be conscious about how much time it takes to actually get the deal into the business office or however you want to complete the, the vehicle transaction. So we have to go, I want to reduce the time it takes to sell a car. Once we make that commitment, I think dealerships are very resourceful. They're very smart. Dealer principals, general managers, sales managers, F and I managers. These are smart individuals. Once they have the goal, they'll figure out a way to make it more efficient and make it a better process and a faster process. And if we can make it faster, we're showing respect for our customers' time. No, so but, I think but you're so right, though. It, it comes down to the goal, right? Yeah, and so and if I, I get my vision, if I go, you know what? My vision is. I just, I just think, I, I think we shouldn't make Jason sit at the dealership for three hours. Yeah. Okay, well, how fast do you think we can do it? I don't know. Can we do it in 30 minutes? Can we do it in 45 minutes? Can we do it in 15 minutes? Well, we'll see what we can do. And you'll start finding a lot of efficiencies that can be done right on the showroom floor. Um, and we can go into some of those. But I think some of the other ideas. Uh, I, here's, another, here's another goal a dealership could have. Mm -hmm. Instead of uh, hiring more salespeople, which is a struggle right now, right, yes, Jason? You, you mentioned that you were, when we were in a, a conversation before the podcast, you've been talking a lot around, around HR and building teams at, mm -hmm. at the dealership. We do know it's difficult right now to hire salespeople. Well, if it's difficult to hire salespeople, how do we make our salespeople more productive? Well, gosh, let's go back to that first vision of reducing the time it takes to transact. And in doing so, I can make a more productive sales force. I mm -hmm. can go from, uh, you know, pre COVID during COVID pre COVID national automobile dealer association, approximately 10 units per salesperson, you know, a shameless plug for fuse, but we, we, we sell 17 units per salesperson. Now those numbers have, uh, climbed tremendously, uh, with the, uh, uh, interest and demand in the market in 2021, but it still hovers in at five to seven more units, uh, when compared to the national average. So first, let's save some time. Secondly, let's make our guys more productive so they can sell more cars. They can make happier customers and I can build that core team. And I don't have to keep piling on people. And that's probably where I would, I'd like to, you know, 
focus first, Jason. Those are the first two things. And I think if we give the stores those ideas, we go, hey, if we try to fix it in store first, what are we trying to fix? We're trying to make our salespeople more productive, our customers happier. And I think we can do it through a form of respect for their time, which is speeding up the transaction, some control in the process in store, not just online. And obviously, if we choose to do so, which I think everybody should be doing this right now, um, Jason is a mm-hmm. pretty consistent Canada or most, um, most stores are fairly close to manufacturer suggested retail price. Yes. And are most used cars in Canada, are they uh, kind of already a one price methodology because the market's efficient? Actually here, no. Really? So no. it's still, that's still a, a, still a little bit United of the States. wild, wild west here. Yeah. Okay. So in the United States, it's a pretty efficient market, but I think it is, the closer we can get to a level of price transparency where we're willing to price our vehicles um, and be upfront in that pricing, mm-hmm. I think all of this falls in line and you can create a killer in-store process that basically, I mean, it's kind of fun. You could even do it. I don't want to say this, but you might, you might not need all the technology even online uh, if you're so seamless in-store and you're so willing to give these customers anything they need to, to make a quick decision and respect their time uh, and giving them some control when they ask for the information. Well, but it all comes down to willingness, right? Yeah, I mean, you, you, you said, you yeah. said the key, the key word right there, uh, you, you, just that last sentence, the, the willingness. Yeah. Look, look, yeah. it's a difference between a goal and a good idea, right? I think a yeah. lot of people will listen to us and they're probably shaking their heads. The idea goes, yeah, guys, I get it. That's a good idea. But look, if, <laughs> if it's, if you don't make a goal out of it, that good idea don't mean crap. It will never actually get done. So it's like you have to actually have a goal. You have to own that goal. And look, there are times where as a dealer principal, I had to make goals that I didn't even really want to make. All right. But I knew it was the best for our operations. I knew it was going to be best, best for our team. But, you know, I think as an industry, we're still holding on to something because here's, here's the issue. Here's the issue with a goal requires work. It does require work, doesn't it? Doesn't a good it? idea, a good idea doesn't because it's a good idea. We can talk about it. Hell, we can have a couple oh, meetings about there. it. We yeah. can whiteboard the whole good idea. It's, this is a great idea. I'd love at the XYZ dealership to do a <laughs> transaction in sixty minutes or less, from the time you walk into the store to the time you complete your 100%. paperwork. You can't take the car yet, but whatever you know, you get the no, idea. No, look, we we could um, document that whole good idea, yeah, but if we and, don't and actually you know, the make only a way to implement it. it, even manually, we'd actually have to timestamp it. We'd have to go, well, how long does it take us to we do gotta measure test? it? Yeah. And, and, and are we okay <laughs> with not doing a test drive with every single customer? Because our process says we have to test drive every car. Now, I'm, not, I'm not advocating for that. I'm not advocating for that. I'm just saying it's a question. No, no, it's a good are point. You, like, can we get them through really? the F&I department? Is there an express F&I version yeah, is, are where we can do really? a second F&I sell later? This is a cash deal, sign and drive lease, whatever it is. I know that desk manager, sales manager, or our senior team lead or uh, account executive, whatever your names are, but your your talented individuals have been with the company for mm-hmm. a, quite some time. Can you give them the packet of paperwork? And are you willing to let them sign out yeah. at the desk, not 100%. in the business office? I don't know. But see, that's but, that's that's the, that's the thing. I think I think for anybody out there that's watching, listening right now, um, you can hear it in our tones. We're getting a little heated about this. But you know, look, nothing is going to happen. You will never be able to create an online to in shopper handoff or a good handoff or a transition if you don't actually make it a goal. If you are sitting there and you're listening to this or you're watching this and you're shaking your head like these guys got some good ideas. Stop. Okay. We don't like good ideas. We like goals. So you got to make it a goal for your operations to actually get this executed. And I think this actually is a good segue into our next topic here because we're going to talk a little bit about digital retailing. And again, you know, there's a goal and then there is a good idea. You know, look, digital retailing is not a magic diet pill. (laughs) <laughs> All right. It's a, oh, it's not that. the, I you know, magic. I got to so lose 20 not, pounds. <laughs> it's not a magic diet pill. Uh, slapping the technology on your dealer website. Uh, it's a widget is not, it's not going to improve your process. But you know what the funny thing is we've actually, we've actually have seen it. I remember, do you remember e-price button? Oh yeah, for sure. You remember that? You remember it was like 20, yeah. 2010, all the way to like maybe 2015 or something like that. Yes. I can walk into a dealership. I, I can increase your internet leads by 40% overnight guaranteed. All I got to do is put this one little button on there. But, and you know what the crazy thing? It actually worked. I know. All right. But, that, but, but you know what ended up happening was is no one actually gave away an e-price. So a customer sure. never got an e-price. You will not sure. find an e-price button on a dealership's website today as an industry would destroyed it. Now, I'm worried 
digital retailing, we're going to do the exact same damn thing here. All right, we're going to make all these promises. The, the customer is not actually going to receive it. And yeah, we're going to destroy this great piece of technology. So here's my question for you. How do we start from process before we get into the technology? Let's go with a story because mm-hmm. we all experience this. Uh, customer goes on the dealer's website, invests their time, and has some control in the process to calculate payments. Yep. Okay? They then come into the dealership to complete the transaction. Why are they coming into the dealership? Because even during COVID, uh, faced with the, the fear of death, um, 90 I mean, uh, the Walzer Automotive Group, 95 plus percent of their transactions still happened in store. So I'd just just call it 99% of all transactions in the United States really still happen uh, in store. When they got to the store, they would run into a salesperson. Maybe they ran into me. And this is kind of the traditional model. Uh, Hey, Jason, thanks for coming into the store today. Uh, You know, how can I help you? Right. And Jason's going to go, I did some work online and I calculated some payment. Oh yeah. We, we don't really use that. That's, that's kind of just a, it's kind of a estimation tool, but luckily you ran into me. I'm good friends with my buddy, Alan, that runs the desk and uh, we'll get you taken care of today. So what were you most interested in? <laughs> exactly. But that's what it is. It is hundred percent. That's what happens. Is. They don't use, they don't, they don't go. Let's, let's go back to this. Uh, this is, this is the, these are the problems we have right now. But it goes back to the goal. Look, if you, if you, okay, so when I had my Mitsubishi dealership, all right, um, I, I made a goal to be innovative and hassle-free. Yes. Now, now um, I, there was a lot of growth pains. <laughs> but ultimately what I ended up having to do was take a look at every single one of my operational processes and determine how I was going to make it either hassle-free or innovative or a combination of both. And yeah. it was tedious. It was tedious. All right, I didn't have digital retelling. You know, mm-hmm. I, had a, I had a mix match of this program and that program and, uh, you know, this process and that process so that I could get to a space like that. But it was going through my processes at the dealership and, and pushing myself to be hassle-free and innovative that then thus actually pushed me towards technology and how yeah. the process and technology had to work side by side. Um, I don't, See, I, I think the reason that digital retailing is still being used as a magic diet pill, hence just like a, a widget to generate yeah. leads. And I, God, I hate that. I hate that. I actually was just in a big dealer group marketing meeting where they brought up how many leads their digital retailing product uh, generated. And I was like, well, who gives a shit? <laughs> like, Because that is not the intent behind that tool. And I, and I just feel like as an it industry, we're missing you say it. That, Jason, you know, think about all how the metrics of these digital retailing software. I know metrics are all, uh, customer user behavior and lead volume. Yeah. Isn't uh, that, isn't that scary though? Not, it's not how many cars we sold, but the, the fact that, well, obviously we want to take credit for those companies love to take credit for the cars that were sold. But the reality is these technologies don't actually tie into legacy systems uh, like CDK, the DMS, multiple exactly. DMS systems, uh, route one and dealer track. Uh, so your, your F and I pipelines, if you will, um, uh, your, uh, F and I products that not only just do generalizations by VIN, but do it by lender and term, mm-hmm. uh, because we know we can't sell gap on a, a Toyota lease, but I can, uh, or we can sell gap on a Toyota lease. I can't sell gap on an ally or U S bank Toyota lease. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think until we make that commitment to connecting all of the legacy systems, uh, digital retailing, which I, I know there was another thread, people hate that name, but shopping online. It really uh, is a shopping experience. Shopping, yeah, it's not quite shopping online because you actually can't buy anything yet. And we're still doing it in store. And that's why me and you are so focused on what can we do in store to correct or create efficiencies in that process so when we are ready and when there's a technology that ties the whole thing in, yep. that's when we can execute. Because other, because otherwise, Fuse Auto Tech, right? We've got a technology. We can throw it online. Mm-hmm. sell a car. We can buy a car online. The reality is if the in-store process isn't dialed in, how can someone actually buy a car online? Because like, you're not going to know what to do because you haven't created these efficiencies in store first. You haven't went through all 
the processes of treating someone like an online customer in store. Well, I'm that's because, them. you know what, we're still creating processes for ourselves and not for our customers. Yeah, exactly. You know, so yeah. it, it's an entirely different mindset. I mean, look, uh, digital retailing um, from a technology perspective is structured with the consumer in mind, not the dealer in mind. Now, yeah. I've seen some shifts in certain companies and I get it. They got to hit revenue and they're sure. talking about lead generation and so on and so forth. But, sure. you know, look, this piece of technology is supposed to connect the dot between the online shopper and the in-store shopper. Um, you know, I'm not looking for it to generate me more leads. I'm looking for me to I've, generate I've, I've, I've more been, customers coming from online in-store. You've probably had dealers <laughs> you work with say I'm getting too many leads, right? Yeah. Over the, yeah. La- over the last few months. I mean, I don't like now, that. I don't like that at all, by the way. I just, <laughs> I get very upset when they say that. Or I actually, I actually, the one that really drives me nuts is the leads are bad. Oh, and you know what? Here's, here's something that I'm going to, I know you get me going. See, you got me going with that yeah. statement. Sorry. Um, you know, it's like, there's look, there's no bad leads. There's bad processes for the leads. That's what it yeah. is. Right. Yeah. And if, it's like, if someone, if someone inquired about a vehicle, they might not be right now. But depending on your follow-up processes, uh, technologies that you know that you implement at stores, they'll buy something at some. Point. So how do we want to handle? It? Where are they at in the funnel, and how do we want to continue to communicate with them? Or do we want to just ignore them? Maybe like some dealerships are still doing because they're not buying in the next two to three days. I don't, you know. So I, I don't. I agree with you. I don't think there's a bad. No, but it all comes back. It all comes back to how we put together our processes and look, yeah. it, look, our usage of technology is not going to stop. It's going to just continue to grow. Yeah. Right. Um, but we need but, to, we, we need to commit our operations, you know, to the usage of those. And that includes training, by the way, we didn't have that actually as a topic, but that's actually something I would love to get your thoughts on because I'm seeing dealerships install these, these wonderful tools on their websites and work with amazing companies like fuse and, and they're yeah. bringing in process and technology and then the salespeople have no idea what the hell's doing, going on. No, you got to go in store first. You got to have the belief, the willingness uh, from from the sales managers, the desk managers, the general sales managers, the general manager, the F and I manager. And when we have that common goal that we're we are going to speed up the transaction, we are going to make a happier customer. We're going to make our sales team more productive. I mean, nothing bad happens. I always joke, nothing bad happens when we sell a new car. Absolutely nothing bad ever happens when we sell a new car. New cars make our business go round and round. How do we make that easier for our customers and more efficient for ourselves in store? Uh, um, maybe, exactly. maybe a simple takeaway is, is um, acknowledging, you know, we acknowledge the customer's work that they've done online through internet follow-up, uh, text message, even phone calls. Maybe we need to start acknowledging them when they come into the store. Uh, maybe it's a process of, 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 uh, pulling up the customer's record and acknowledging that, that, that we've saved a few payments. And I see those payments that you saved is, is that just doing a, a little looking and shopping around online? Uh, did you hone into, you know, whatever the, the, the word track might be. Uh, but, but I think there could be some simple takeaways that, that don't require heavy, heavy technology even in store yet. But um, I do believe Jason that in store is where we need to fix. Uh, once we fix it in store, once we have a common goal, of again, price of transparency, uh, price transparency, uh, giving the customer, you know, respect of their time and control of the process. I think everything's going to get really easy. I'm, I'm with you, you know, and it's like, I was kind of thinking earlier because we were talking about good ideas and this is a great segue kind of into our, our, our topic, you know, it's a, a good idea should be developed out into a process and the process should be built around, well, built with the intent to achieve whatever our goal is. And it's like we kind of maintain that. It's like I take good idea. Good idea needs to get generated into a process at the operations level. And that process needs to actually um, be developed with the intent to actually uh, hit our goal and our objective. And it's like if we continue to maintain that, then we can take on. We can take on a lot. We can take on oh, sure. multiple pieces of technology. We can take on um, new challenges. We can take on as many leads as they can probably throw at us. But, you know, yeah. this kind of goes into our next topic, talking about good ideas, um, because I love – you guys is Ignite product, and it yeah. all started with a good idea. And yeah. a lot of us have good ideas, but a good idea is only as good as how well we can actually execute the damn thing. And you got a cool story about how you yeah. actually executed it. I'd love to hear it. 
Yeah, so this idea, um, the idea was uh, born in, in 2012. Uh, the idea was, uh, I wonder uh, if I can uh, generate uh, VIN-specific vehicle offers, update a dealership's website, update their digital ads, and, and just make it really simple, fast, and easy to get the start of our month kicked off. Because I remember sitting uh, at the desk as a sales manager, new incentives would come out, and I'd be, it was, uh, I was using dealer track, uh, sales maker at the time, or I'd use CDK. And I'd just start banging through, uh, through vehicle offers and just trying to, trying to create specials that would be very attractive for our customers and uh, create, you know, a great uh, message on, on our showroom floor, get our sales staff excited. But the idea, I didn't say it would, I don't, I don't think it died at that point, but I, I just, I didn't see a way to scale this idea yet. Um, and I wasn't ready to invest the time into to making it happen. So fast forward, uh, I started working at the Walzer Automotive Group uh, as their marketing director. And my frustration was at the end, uh, at the beginning of every single month, I would have to reach out to our general managers. Uh, there's 20 plus stores in the group. And I'd ask for these special offers. Uh, typically, I would be on two or three core products. And uh, that process of back and forth, even using Excel spreadsheets and, and nice communication devices, it took me a week to get all of these stores updated with hero slides online, an updated specials page, and then all of this information uh, sent to our uh, digital ad uh, agency. I said, there's got to be a better way. Well, I found a tool uh, called Market Scan. It was M-Desking. It was a, a desking, really, a software that, that was used by a few of our stores. And what I found, and this is, this is a great thing to ideas, figure out a way to do the idea manually first yes. before you made anything. So I found M-Desking and I had a team of marketing analysts and I trained everyone in the Walzer marketing department how to use M-Desk. And what we actually started doing was we actually created the offers for the stores at the beginning of the month. You're probably cool. your mind's going like yep. this, Jason. No, no, no. Yeah, I'm with I've you. Got, I got marketing analysts running numbers that we would typically get from the sales manager. Mm -hmm. But really with the Walzer Automotive Group, because they were a progressive dealer group that they do one price, so the, the pricing was the price. So it was very easy. Uh, I took their price. I Typically, special offers don't have any markup unless required by unless requested by the store. So I'd strip out the car deal. We'd do one at this price, and we would start generating all the offers. So that was really great. We went from about a week of getting offers online, and I think we collapsed that to about four or five days. Mm -hmm. Maybe better sometimes, worse sometimes, but but it was more efficient, significantly more efficient. The other interesting thing because. Um, I had the marketing analysts doing this, this work. They didn't know that 36 month was always the term that they should choose. So Jason, <laughs> guess what happened? You started actually using 36 months at the dealership. <laughs> <laughs> well, we started actually finding other terms. We actually started finding 24, 27, 30, 33 month, 42 month, 39, because they didn't know all they're doing is looking for the lowest payment. Uh, and I usually, I gave them some parameters. I said, I want you to run a sign and drive. I want you to run a zero down payment and I want you to run 10% down, yep. which is similar to the manual OEM. Sure. They kind of percent of the MSRP. And before you know it, they, they were coming up with like weird, odd terms. I'm, I'd go look at their work and I go, Oh, interesting. Yeah. And then I go, wait a minute. That's not the lend That's not the OEM lender. That's, that's uh, this credit union or that's Ally or that's U S bank or that's, it just, it was really fun. And before you know it, because they were doing such a good job, marketing analyst for the sales manager, the sales manager said, you guys are doing a good job, continue to do that. So I knew we had something. So at this point, uh, I told Andrew Walzer, you know, I'd like to hire a developer, <laughs> which I think he kind of said, what do you need a developer in marketing for? And I don't know what I told him at the time, but he agreed. To. And we started on building the technology Ignite, where it would actually run all of the vehicles every single night in stock by all of the every single car in stock, all new cars, and it would find the best offers agnostic of lender and agnostic of term, which is pretty cool. Mm -hmm. So we'd start finding these crazy deals, which brings me to my story. First, basically the first few weeks after we started, mind you, the development of this took about a year. 
but we got it running. At least the MVP, the minimum viable product. I saw the spreadsheet, this automated generated spreadsheet that was sent via email. This is before we had a web-based portal and a dashboard and all this cool stuff. Mm -hmm. And I saw a $48,000 Toyota Tundra SR5 TRD Sport package. So it's not a TRD. It's not a pro, but it's the the TRD Sport. So it's got the cool sway bars, the 20-inch wheels, the hood scoop. This thing is trick. $48,000 $48,000 truck. And I had them run about 10,000 miles. The system we had to run at 10,000 miles. The sign and drive at our current pricing, not employee pricing, which was a couple grand off of MSRP, maybe 2,500 bucks off of MSRP, different time mm-hmm. in uh, those years back. It was $250 a month sign and drive. What? I went over to the store. I said, I called up the store. I said, Hey, do you guys have this Toyota? What colors? I didn't know what color. There's no pictures online. Great merchandising, right? Of course. <laughs> That's my responsibility. I'll take, I'll take that. Um, I said, what is this? What's this truck? <laughs> What's wrong with it? No, it's here. It's blue. It's Calvary blue. I said, it's got this pack. Is that? Yep. Can you pull it aside? I'm going to come over there. I drove my butt over there. <laughs> I looked at it. I used our system again. I reran the payments at 15 K. It came out to $285 a month. Uh, It's not through TFS. It was for 24 months. And I am just, I just extended that lease three months uh, today. So now you can figure out the the term, (laughs) how long ago it was, two years and three months ago. Uh, But I'm driving this Toyota uh, Tundra for 285 a month. It's funny. Story goes, uh, drive the car home. I'm really excited. It's technically my first new car after being in the car business for I don't know at that time, 15, 16 years. So I'm really proud of myself. I show my parents as we all do. Uh, I go into work the next day, Greg Davis. I love our general manager to to death. He's an incredible individual. He's a true leader. Uh, He's inspirational. Uh, He calls me on my phone and says, I'm in Andrew Walzer's office telling Andrew about this truck. He goes, Hey Colton, you got to bring that truck back. That deal's not real. I'm like, I just told my parents, I told Andrew, I'm proud of myself. The system's working. I bring the truck back to the dealership. I go through this, the program with him and show him how I arrived at the numbers, which was an 89% residual. Oh my gosh. Unbelievable. That's crazy. Unbelievable. That's crazy. And I was able to stack all of the standard rebates, which were like 5,000 or 6,500 of rebates because it was a non-captive lender. Oh, geez. And, uh, and he goes, that's a real deal. Why doesn't everybody on my showroom floor know about this? <laughs> and uh, fast forward, I'll end the story. Uh, Walzer Toyota has been the number one volume Tundra Tacoma truck dealer probably for the last couple of years. <laughs> That's uh, awesome. Because we, we found a diamond in the rough and, and the program did it and we automated it and we stayed with our idea and we've got it across the finish line. And, and to this day, uh, we automate all specials for the entire Walls or Automotive Group uh, as prices of vehicles change, the offers change dynamically online and through digital advertisements and through the dashboard. And uh, we also, um, as incentives change from the manufacturer, the offers are updated. So when there's holiday bonus cash, that's all done automatically. And uh, we also, instead of just focusing on core models, which you know that the Tacoma and the Tundra aren't core models. No. We focus on every model because last time I checked, uh, as we talked earlier, uh, someone that's interested in a, uh, I don't know, a, a, a Avalon could give sure. two crap what your RAV4 offer is, right? <laughs> That's totally true. That is absolutely true. That is such a great story. No, no, no. That's, that's a great story of how you go from an idea and you hold on to it and you, you get it, you get it past execution and it works so damn well. You sold yourself a car. I sold um, myself a car. You sold I, yourself a car. I did. But but but, I but, did. but but I think a lot of people out there, what you know, a lot of dealerships and a lot of people that may be listening and watching this, they get these great ideas and they think they're going to execute it in a week. And it's not. I mean, look, it took you a year just to get to the point an where Excel you could generate an just Excel an sheet. Automated, yeah, an automated email that's that sent to me every day. That, that's, that's it. Like. Just, just an Excel sheet just to get to that point, you know, with all the yeah. data that was required to do this. But I think this is a great segue kind of into our next conversation because, you know, uh, data and I think the future of our industry 
there's just so much there. There is so yeah. much there. I mean, look, the fact that you went to your owner and the owner and asked to hire a developer and, you know, he kind of went, hmm? Like, but gave you, you the okay, gave you the thumbs up, gave you, you the thumbs very up. Very progressive. Very Andrew progressive. Is, like, is gave amazing. you the thumbs up, said, I don't get it why the marketing department's asking for a developer, but I'm willing to find out why. And yeah. what a huge payoff at the end of the day. But I think our operations is needs to change. And I think the future impact of what first party data is going to yeah. do on dealer yeah. operations is monstrous. We had a chance to kind of jam about this a little bit before we started yeah. recording and you had some great ideas. So I'd love to hear how you think that's going to impact our operations. Well, yeah, I think let's going back to that position. So um, maybe even taking a step back even further. Um, I think we focused a bunch, Jason, on how we're going to communicate with our customers, mm -hmm. where we're going to communicate, um, what's that touch point, that interaction, what's that creative look like. But I think we have a tough time finding out exactly who we're going to communicate with and then what messages or content are we going to put into that messaging. So as we were talking, you know, I think there's going to be some innovative positions and in dealerships in the new, near future. Maybe it's a, you, you called it, um, what did you call it? Uh, the data manager. Uh, maybe yes, I'm calling it a, a head of data. Um, maybe it's data scientist, but, but I think we, we need to really get smarter in our industry and really uh, start focusing on the correct people um, that are going to do business with us in short order. We need to have the, the short term plan, the mid term, and then and the long term. And, and although I love uh, lookalike audiences, and I think that's a great way to build campaigns, um, we need to start looking at first party data. We need to understand how to extract or buy that data, that mm -hmm. first party data. Um, and then obviously, we need creative and campaigns that are built in a way that communicates to these segments of customers that we've built to make an impact on, on our business, not only in the short term, mid term, but long term. Um, but I do think the future of our business will not be how much shinier is the widget or delivery device of the uh, creative that we come up with. It will be, how are we talking to Colton and how are we talking to Jason yes. and to, do they know that Colton ex just extended his lease three months and do they know he wants another pickup truck and, you know, do they know my habits and do they know when I'm re-engaged in the market and how do I get directly to talk to him so we can move away from this spray and pray. And, and I'm actually putting lookalike audiences a little bit into that because sure. look, lookalike is better than, and hanging out a billboard, which I don't have any issues with billboards. We use those too. And we use television, but I think if you segment your thought process, I'm, I'm focusing on the, the short term, you know, really quick wins customers that are in market shopping. How can I communicate with them effectively with the right message at the right time? What's my midterm strategy? Those that aren't going to buy in the first few days of their, of their shopping habits. And then what's my long-term play for my brand? Yes. Uh, which you're, which you're so good at, um, you know, what is that overarching message that I'm always going to talk about, uh, with the Walzer automotive group, it, it's a combination of Walzer buys cars, uh, Walzer to you, uh, and some of the other initiatives we have going on, but how do we always, you know, communicate with the right people at the right time? I think that's what I'm trying to say. Well, and, and uh, it's not just a marketing play, right? No. It, it goes into your operations. And I think I'm, I'm with you. I'm hundred percent with you on this, right? I think that the future, success of our industry is going to be um, highly weighed on how well we actually understand and use our first party data, you know, and, and look, yes. I think there's some dealerships out there that don't even necessarily understand what first party data is in the first yeah. place. We could probably do a whole podcast just on understanding what's first, what's, what's, what's second. Is there a third party? What's what, what are all these and what, parties? And, what, and, and what, why am I not invited to these parties? Yeah. And then Jason, what does a lookalike really mean? Exactly. Like, because I think we hear this and we've been, it's been promoted so much by these digital ad companies that we do and agencies that we do business with. Bless their heart. They do a wonderful job. Um, but I think we can do better. hundred percent. We can do better, you know, we and, can and, do better. We and, can, and our the, dollars can stretch further. And, and I think the last 19 months showed us that. 
Yes. Right. You yeah. know, like I hate to identify silver linings. I really, really do. Uh, but I, I it, like as an industry, uh, we found out that we can do a lot more with less. And I think we're starting to look at not just our, our sales and our revenue, but also our processes, our operations, how much more efficient we can be, but also in our marketing. And it's like, how can we do more? And look, the better we embrace our data <laughs> and really embrace yeah. it. It's like, how do we use this information and where can I get it? And, and how can I bring that into, you know, my marketing, but it's going to determine who's going to be successful and who's not. I a hundred percent agree. I mean, think about it. Let's tie it all together. Uh, we, we create some efficiencies where we have some price transparency. Mm -hmm. uh, right now the walls are on them. I'm not to use them again as an example, but uh, I was just demoing the fuse auto tech product and I found um, we currently have Tacomas uh, with markup built into the car deal uh, selling at MSRP and you can get a $39,000, $40,000 Tacoma, so not the Tundra, the Tacoma uh, double cab um, through the software for uh, $374 a month with $1,700 total due at signing. This taxes, registration, everything on. It's actually a really fantastic deal and we're leveraging technology right now. We're giving that to the salespeople, we're putting it online, automated through specials, integration into our digital ads. It's in the platform they use. And guess what? Now, since we're using first party data, and I know Colton's shopping for trucks again, they also know I'm shopping for Dodge Rams right now, but still they can have an app. And I'm on thinking, I'm thinking of Ram because the pricing is pretty good still on Rams, even at MSRP. Yes. But now that dealership can get me with the right ad at the right time, the 374 a month, zero down payment, first in fees, do it signing. Got to put our marketing hats on, right? Sure. 1700 total, do it signing. <laughs> that might engage me to go back and talk to this store, which I might actually talk about. I might actually go look at this. It's a cool army green colored uh, Tacoma, and I'm not certain I need a full size. So um, <laughs> but that's just kind of how it ties it all together, right? The store is empowered to do something quickly and provide you know, price transparency. They respect my time because they see what I'm looking at. Our marketing is tied in. All the offers are online. It's easy to see. It's easy for me to, to take the next step. And because the store is empowered, they can talk about that. And our marketing is intelligent enough to know that Colton's in the market for a truck. So I should probably serve him valid truck. Offers. That's where I see us going. That's Absolutely. What I well, you know, and that's, that's, what where, that's where we should be going, right? It's, yeah. it's uh, putting even in our marketing efforts, we talked earlier about putting our goals and our processes and our good ideas and putting the customer yeah. first before the transaction. And, yes. you know, we have technology out there that's doing that. Digital retailing does that. Digital retailing puts the customer first before the yeah. dealership's process or the, dealer, the dealership transaction. Um, and now we're talking about the exact same thing, right? How, how data or data, depending on what side of the board you're on, <laughs> tomato, tomato. All right. data, data, yeah. <laughs> but how that, but how that data is going to impact our, impact our marketing efforts. And again, now putting the customer first, knowing what I know about you as an individual and then marketing to you uh, appropriately and not just wasting your time serving up crap that you have absolutely no interest in at yeah. all. This has been or even, or even worse, right? Jason, yeah. the crap that, that actually alludes to there's a real offer there and they click through to it and they, they, oh. they get to a dead page on the dealer website or an SRP with a million of cars. And I don't actually know which one that was. Yes. And it's so frustrating because then what that happens, then you and you and me would, uh, well, we might send in an inquiry, an internet lead, or we might call or chat or text the store or just show up and go, hey, I want to take advantage of this thing that I screenshotted because I clicked back and then tried to capture it on my phone. And I go, ooh, they go, oh, did you just see that? that uh, I think that one just rolled off the lot. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Just, you just missed just it, now, Jason. Just now, just now. Right there. It was right there this right morning. There. <laughs> and, those are the, and those are the crappy things that we do to our customer and we got to stop. And, and we can avoid that now. 100% we yeah. can avoid that. I mean, like, it's funny. It's, everything we're kind of talking about does kind of lead back to uh, letting the customer maintain control. Not like how I got trained as a salesperson. Maybe you got trained as a salesperson. Oh, it, I did we're, too. We're, I did we're, too. we're beyond the age of making the customer hold the hood open for us. Yeah. All right. We are in the age of letting the customer uh, drive the transaction as much as possible and let us kind of be that co-pilot and I think the dealerships that embrace that through their goals and through their processes and their good ideas and their usage of data moving forward are going to be incredibly 
incredibly successful. But Colton, before I let you go, because we talked about some amazing topics today, and there's definitely some people out there that are probably watching and listening and would probably love to continue to have this conversation, you know, with sure. you or someone from your team. What what is the best way to connect with you? They can just reach we'd reach out to me directly. Um it's uh, super simple. Uh, Colton, C O L T O N, at fuseautotech.com, which is in the bottom right hand corner, at least of the screen that I'm looking at right now. Uh, or you can call me on my cell. You can also text me. Uh, my cell is 612 760 1435. Always happy to talk. Awesome. I love when people throw their phone numbers out there. It's like, hey, you like, you like what I said on that strategy, Jason episode? Text Give me. Give me a call. call. Shoot me a text. Okay. <laughs> Throw some smoke signals up. I'm there. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> hey, Colton, thank you so much for your time today. I've had a blast jamming with you. Pretty confident yeah. this won't be the uh, first or last time uh, or the last time that we do this. We will definitely be doing this again. Hey, you have yourself an amazing day. Thank you. Thanks, Jason. Thanks for tuning in to the Strategy with Jason podcast with your host, Jason Harris. Don't want to miss new content? Be sure to check out the full podcast library at strategywithjason.com to stay in the know. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe. Happy podcasting.